Two short. One green. This is Hamilton, Ontario, the biggest industrial town in the country. I call you Vice Chief. That's a good ball, is it? You know, this is the kind of town that millions of industrial workers and their families have grown up in. In fact, Hamilton, really the symbol of industry in the country. It's been a good place to live, good place to raise your family. The kind of town that through the years meant jobs, meant security, meant that you had a real future that you could look forward to. This is a town and a way of life built on the strong backs and the paychecks of generations of industrial workers. It's almost 3 p.m., shift change in Hamilton, and the workers here are ready to head for home without a backward look. Halfway around the world from Hamilton, the industrial workers of the future are still hard at work. And they won't be expecting overtime. The robots in this Japanese factory are making other robots. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, without a break. All of which raises a question. Who will find jobs in the years ahead? Will enough new jobs be created to replace the old ones? Will they be better jobs? Who will be hired? 2,000 years ago, Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, said, when the looms weave on their own, man will be free. But free to do what? I think the next 25 years will be one of the most exciting periods in human history. The new technologies cascade upon one another so that we will find problems of disease being solved, problems of famine being solved. There is the potential to do absolute miracles that make everything that's happened in the past seem like nothing. We're gonna be looking at an unemployment level that's gonna make what we have now 10%. That, that'll be the good old days. That, we'll, we'll be longing for that. But one way or another, a revolution has begun and there is no turning back. It wasn't so long ago people in Hamilton would have laughed at the idea of unemployment. These were the good old days. It seemed that the party would never end. This was Steel Town, and proud of it. This was a town of blast furnaces and smokestacks, steel mills and foundries. And the crown jewel was the Steel Company of Canada. Occasionally, visitors who didn't know any better would complain about the bitter smell in the air. But to Hamiltonians, it was the sweet smell of jobs. There was a deal here. Most of it wasn't written down, but every worker knew it by heart. The workers got the jobs, and the companies got the profits. If you worked hard and stayed out of trouble, chances were it was a job for life. Everyone knew 
we would always have thousands and thousands of jobs to make steel. It was a basic component of the, the social order of uh, the way we do business in this society. Once you got in at Stalco, if you survived the potential of layoffs for the first year or so, you were pretty well set for life. And it was pretty steady employment, and the world was quite black and white in that respect. How would you describe your ideal man? Well, he'd have to be sincere. He wouldn't be phony. He'd have to be intelligent. He'd have to be good looking in my estimation. He'd have to have characteristics that I liked. He'd have to be a good dancer. Um, he'd have to have a very good job. And I would like to go up the ladder of success with him. This is Ivor Wynn Stadium, home of a team called the Tiger Cats. It's also home to local 1005 of the United Steelworkers of America, the Stelco local. Not exactly pussycats either. In their heyday, this was the only place big enough to hold the steel workers when they met to prepare for battle against the company bosses. They seek to turn you against me and this committee. Well, let me tell you that with the money that Stelco pays us, I sure can't afford to be a capitalist. So I guess I am a socialist. So it went in Hamilton. The old game played back and forth, a round won, a round lost. Until in 1981, the rules suddenly changed. First, it was the recession. Right across the country, factories closed and the layoffs began. At first, everyone thought it was temporary. Yeah, but I don't believe it, really. It's, uh, I don't think so it can happen. How long do you figure it'll last? Hopefully not more than the winter. We'll take the winter off and come back in the spring and we'll be all set. But they were wrong. The recession ended and Canadians woke up to find that many of the jobs were gone forever. Under cover of the recession, with little fanfare, a revolution had begun. What we're seeing is the beginning of what everyone knew so supposedly would never happen, where the microchip technology has hit the steel industry. But we're looking that where there used to be 100 people, we're going to have two or three working. And where are our children going to work? Never mind where we're going to work. Who to believe that something as small as this could topple a world and cause a revolution? But that's exactly what's happened. This is a microchip. It's turned our world upside down. To get an idea of just how important this tiny computer on a chip has become, you have to take a look at how dramatically the technology has changed in just the last 30 years. The first computers were fantastically expensive. Look at this baby, the Sage, the biggest computer ever built in the world. Look at all these old vacuum tubes. You associate this with your old TV sets from the 1950s. Imagine trying to repair that. The thing had 55,000 of them, weighed 250 tons, the size of a house, and with a price tag of $300 million. In the 50s, about the only institution in the world that could afford one of these things was the US military. The SAGE was the computer that watched the skies over North America for the approach of enemy bombers. Then in the early 1960s, computers made the leap from vacuum tubes to transistors. Computers like this were a huge advance over the SAGE, but they were still comparatively expensive. 
$150,000 for this one. And then came the microchip, tiny, easily installed almost anywhere. And like this one, with the power of 250,000 transistors. This was the technology of our dreams, incredibly powerful computers that cost a few dollars and could go anywhere. A fantastic world of pleasure and convenience. The latest way to go shopping, by television. And you'll love downtown, where fully automatic moving sidewalks will make you feel up to date and wonderful. For the home of distinction, the all-purpose family robot. For decades, we had dreamed that inventions like this would usher us into a new world where our biggest worry would be spending all our leisure time. All aboard for your vacation in outer space. Relax and enjoy all the romance of a lunar weekend. But the reality is turning out to be somewhat less rosy. For some employers, the new technology they line up to see at trade fairs will perhaps mean more profits and more freedom. But for a lot of workers in a lot of industries, labor-saving technology is just a machine that can do your job. Service and support ensures that your investment in CAD CAM will return the results you demand. Of course, that's not how they sell it here. It's a menial job, and this won't make a mistake. And it doesn't get tired or anything else. It doesn't look for any money or raises. It just keeps going until it has some work to do. The recession made people willing to try new things in order to survive. And the prospects for new kinds of automation exploded overnight. Thank you. And yet, while the new technology opens up a world of wonders, as the first glow wears off, it becomes apparent that for a lot of employers, it was just a way to get rid of their employees and to de-skill the ones that remain. The system was developed to find defective carrots. Um, what I'm going to do is place a pen right beside the defective parrot, carrots. So I'll start the program going. In the past, there's been a fair amount of flexibility, that even though workers didn't, in theory, have any power. In practice, they managed to acquire and, and wield a fair amount of power. The old thing of the secretary, uh, you know, if the secretary books off sick, the whole office grinds to a halt. And similarly, people who used to run warehouses, they were, I mean, king or queen, usually king, that was his turf. You wanted to know where something was? The guy around the warehouse was the only one who knew. And he could slow you up or speed you up, depending on, you know, how, you're, how well you treated him and how willing he was to cooperate. Now you've got these pieces of software that run things. There's an awful lot of planning goes into uh, buying the equipment, designing the equipment, uh, sort of figuring out in a business sense how it's going to be used. And it's sort of always a, a last minute sort of afterthought, well, what are we going to do about the people? The incentives are all to short-term results. And so employers are making decisions which they can show over the next three months or 12 months major productivity gains to heck with the, if it wrecks the society along the way. Yeah, pretty expensive. Cost of capital is very expensive, and especially two years ago. About three ways and 300 days for a bank which had been operated by another party. kinds of people that we believe being displaced by technology. Uh, but it has been too much, I think, disguised by the uh, recession that we went through in the, from 81 on. And uh, it was sort of used as, as the depression as the excuse for uh, people being laid off. But those people are not being called back. But unless you remove something, all the time. No one is immune. That should be the first law of automation from assembly lines to offices, from forklift operators to clerks. 
AutoCAD provides you with... The impact of the new technology on office work of all kinds will be, if anything, more dramatic than in traditional industries. AutoCAD also offers you a power... If it's happening first far from here in places like Hamilton, it's only because the incentive for automation is so much greater in higher paid unionized jobs in industries like steel. This is Hilton Works, owned by Stelco, the biggest steel plant in Canada, spread across 1,100 acres on Hamilton Harbor. In the boom years of the 60s and 70s, close to 14,000 workers had jobs here. When it was first fired up 25 years ago, this open hearth was the largest in the world. Inside the hearth was a lake of molten steel, and they made 500 tons of it every four hours. In the post-war boom, the steel from this open hearth built cars and appliances for a world of consumers. The market for steel grew and grew, and the mills got bigger, and there was work for everyone. Until 1981. When the recession hit and the demand for steel dropped, Stelco closed this open hearth. All across the plant, the layoffs began. From a peak of just under 14,000, the steel workers are down to under 9,000. The company brought in a new plant manager, Bob Milborn, to crack the whip. make the change, is that going to mean fewer jobs here at Hilton? I could turn that around and say it'll probably mean there will be more jobs here at Hilton than there otherwise would have been if we had not made this investment. Certainly, the steel business cannot support the numbers of people that at one, at one time was capable of supporting. But in order to have a steel business, you have to meet a certain threshold of productivity as well as quality and cost. On the other hand, no one is denying the need for new technology. The steel workers know better than anyone that the mill has been allowed to run down. The only question now is who will pay for it? It's the steel workers with their jobs. Many of the workers who still have jobs are older men who have been with the company for years and figured by now they could coast on an easier job. They were wrong. They set about having an occupation. They've had it all of those years. They just never thought in their wildest dreams that after at least 25 or 30 years that we would have to change occupations. George Jilk's occupation was operating a locomotive, one of the best jobs in the plant. But the microchip technology goes anywhere and can automate almost any job. And in the last year, the company has begun introducing remote-controlled engines. A little black box will replace the engineer. And by the time they're through, some 200 jobs will disappear. Bill Sheriffs will be one of them. I What's going to happen to you now? To be quite honest with you, I have no idea. I really don't know. I, I could end up uh, changing my occupation altogether. It's, it's kind of scary because for 21 and a half years, I haven't done any real physical labor. All of a sudden now, I could very well be with a shovel in my hand. At 21 and a half years, you have to understand that I'm only one of the junior employees. There are people that are going to be displaced from their job with 25, 30, and 35 years seniority. Those workers with enough seniority to still have a job at Hilton Works at all often find that those jobs have changed for the worse. Since the open house shut down, I've lost $700 to $800 a month on income. You've got to adapt. You've got to adapt. Uh, I've got two children now and another one expected in uh, another week. It's getting rough. I've seen a lot of my friends that have lost their houses.
has lost their cars, their marriages have broke up. What happens to those who lose their jobs? Well, for a year they collect unemployment insurance and hope to be recalled. When that hope finally runs out, young and old, they end up here at the unemployment office to look at the boards <coughs> and face the prospect of starting over again. Mr. Reed there? Well, I'll hang on until you get a hold of him. I'll hang on until you get a hold of him. Mm. Well, like I take any job right now, you know, like I even work, I like work for the city or any job, you know? Yeah, hey, Bob, this is John Moss phone down there. You told me to phone back there about getting in there to work. Yeah, well, they know, they know me down there. <laughs> so not, another couple weeks yet, eh? That's it. That's it. Okay, thanks a lot. Good luck. Bye-bye. Right. Next, please. Hi, how are you? Looking for a full time or part time? Well, I'm looking for anything, but I prefer full time, eh? Okay, let's come back to that one. Okay. okay. All right. It's for the New Village Restaurant on King Street West. So it's down towards the west end of it. Seven in the morning until six in, in the evening, six days a week. Does that that seems agreeable? Or sure. Yeah. Oh yes, there are jobs. Jobs for dishwashers and short order cooks, for cleaners, maids, babysitters, peace workers. Jobs where minimum wage is about all you can expect. Nobody there? Nobody there. For the industrial workers, it all comes as a shock. But many young men and women of all ages have never had a taste of anything better, or very few of them. What kind of work were you doing before that? Waitressing, um, working in small factories that were pretty well all women. Minimum wage was like three and a quarter. Um, restaurant jobs, 250, whatever. Um, and then you're going into Stelco and you're talking about $13 an hour. Big difference. Though women worked in the steel plants during the war, it wasn't until around 1980 that women put enough pressure on the union and the union put enough on Stelco that a few got back in. Donna Segrin was one of the first. I, I would operate the crane with tears running down my eyes saying, no, I'm staying, I'm staying, because it's good bucks. <laughs> but the good bucks didn't last for long. When the layoffs started just before Christmas of 1981, Donna's was one of the first jobs to go. During the first layoff, I had six children at living at home. I was just devastated by it. I was angry. I became very radical. Welfare means seeing your children do without. But there's one thing I won't do without, and that's my dignity. Because you see, I know it's not my fault. Despite all the protests and demonstrations, the layoffs continued, and gradually the fighting words began to ring hollow. The second time I was laid off, it kind of was like, well, we did everything we could do in 81 and 82 as far as protest went, and it was kind of accepted that you're laid off. The steel workers were scared. In a move echoed across the continent, local 1005 voted out the hardliners and voted for leaders who would not offend the company. Ray Salenzi was elected as president. Why did the membership vote for you? Well, what we had here for the last three years was a lot of publicity, and, and the members in that plant really didn't want that type of publicity. They didn't want to be associated with that type of thing. And what happened was is um, you had them vote accordingly. They wanted somebody in there, uh, probably low profile, to stay out of the press as much as possible. The company has managed to convince the former militants of Local 1005 that the rules of the game have changed and the old plant will have to upgrade or close. Fifty miles from Hamilton, in a farmer's field, is Stelco's most convincing argument. It's called Lake Erie Works, the most advanced major steel plant in North America. 
they can produce three times as much steel per worker as they can at the old plant. Few of the steel workers from Hamilton were invited down here when the plant opened. Stelco wanted a new worker, dedicated, enthusiastic, and without a long union history. Stelco calls this a lean, mean steel producing facility. The steel workers of Hamilton call it a betrayal. They're, they're part of the deindustrialization and the vote of non confidence in the Hamilton community. They're, they're abandoning the community and the people and the families that made them what they are. They're pumping and building up this business of trade centers and convention centers and so on. Like, are my daughters, are they slated to be hostesses at conventions? Uh, uh, what about my son? Where does he get to work? Uh, where do our children work? I don't know. Two more weeks now. All the studies that have been done show the services field will increase in the future. And uh, the industrial base is going to re, you know, be reduced. So we in, uh, in Steel will be looking around to organize in, in areas um, where there are unorganized people and need the help that the union can give. The union made them strong in the past, but these days the union is busy recruiting new members in industries with a future, security guards, makers of women's sanitary products, assemblers of patio furniture, and nurses' aides. Behind their words is a simple protest. This was not supposed to happen. The steel workers are bitter today because they feel that an old deal has been betrayed. One that they and other industrial workers fought and died for. A deal that has its roots in another continent 150 years ago when the industrial age began. This is the Tong Valley in Lancashire, England. 150 years ago, there wouldn't have been much of a view because of all the smoke pouring out of the dozens of smokestacks down in that valley. These were cotton mills, mills for the dyeing, spinning, weaving, and treating of cotton fiber and woven cloth. In the early 1800s, these mills were open six days a week, 13 hours a day. The dark, satanic mills of the first industrial revolution. The Tong Valley deserves a special place in history because it was here that the first industrial revolution was born. Here in this valley, a weaver named Samuel Crompton invented a machine he called the spinning mule. It was the very first factory machine, able to do the work of thousands of hands. It was hailed as brilliant, revolutionary. And yet, to those whose hands had once done the work, the spinning mule was an invention of the devil. So for seven years, while he worked on the smaller prototype, Samuel Crompton was forced to hide it in a cubby hole in his attic. In its time, the spinning mule was as disruptive as the microchip is today. And yet, once Samuel Crompton had invented it, there was no going back. It was a new world. For the first time, a bell rang out over these hills and valleys, summoning workers to work in a factory. They look pretty tame to us now, but to the early factory workers, these were monstrous, noisy, dangerous machines. And while we are inclined to look back at the Industrial Revolution and say that all this was inevitable, in fact, the early factory owners here had to compete with well-established craftsmen. 
So to take control of the cotton industry, the early factory owners had to do new things. They had to do something called primitive accumulation. Primitive accumulation is a nice phrase, but in plain English, what it means is this. In North America, they had to steal from the Indians. In the United Kingdom, they had to drive small farmers off the land. And in factories like this one, they had to exploit children. Children were a key to the takeoff of the factory system in this country. Children were brought into these mills at the age of eight. They were brought in supposedly as apprentices, but in fact, they were little better than slaves. They worked 13 or 14 hours a day. Some of the children had to crawl under the machinery to gather pieces of cotton and bring them back into production. The children wrote pathetic letters, but in fact, most of them never reached the people that they were sent to. Not that it would have made much difference if they had. The politicians and social critics of the day had decided in their wisdom that child labor was a healthy antidote to vagrancy, idleness, and youthful crime. What they did not say was that the profits these children earned for the cotton mill owners were bankrolling the British Empire. But between 1803 and 1938, cotton was Britain's leading export, the backbone of British trade, 135 years. It was the first industry to make the whole world its market. It was an industry Britain had stolen from India stolen by means of new technology like the spinning mule, new ideas like the factory system, and of course, child labor. For 150 years, the cotton industry here flourished. But by the 1930s, Britain's hold on its empire was crumbling, and a new competitor had thrown down the gauntlet. In the 1930s, Japan was emerging from the feudal era and it embarked on an industrial revolution of its own. In the cotton industry, the Japanese rejected the by now old-fashioned spinning mule for the new ring frame in modern factories that worked round the clock. In 1937, Japan swept the head of Britain as the leading exporter of cotton goods. But behind the smoke of the great industrial cities, the old feudal system remained. The big plants, for all their new equipment, were but the strongholds of a modern medievalism. Their machines... Western propaganda ridiculed it, but much of Japan's strength was due to an industrial contract that bound employer and employee by vows of loyalty, as it had once bound lord and serf. Industrial harmony, the Japanese had discovered, was a powerful weapon in the modern world. Then came World War II, and by 1945, Japan lay in ruins. But not for long. Back in Lancashire, the impact was less dramatic, but more permanent. Little factory towns like this one, that had blossomed with the cotton trade, never recovered. The technology was too old the new markets too far away. By the mid-1960s, the factories that had clattered on every street corner were closing at the rate of one a week. And so the circle turns. Empires rise and fall, each time leaving behind a wasteland. 
Child labor was by now just a footnote in the history books. But in the dark factory towns of the Industrial Revolution, the British working class learned a bitter lesson, one they would carry with them wherever they went. Tim, you got a square sheet? Is that? Yeah, right here. Oh, Except for the RBIs. Come on, okay. guys, we got to hold them here. <laughs> Just do it. For the time it took a generation, and then another, to grow up and have children of their own, right, Hamilton and the places like it were the golden cities of an industrial age. The American empire rose with all the promise of the empires before it. For Canadians, on the northern edge of manifest destiny, the post-war years have been pretty good. And on certain summer evenings, it is still possible to believe that the old game will go on forever. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Gotta mix them up, gotta mix them up, Kella. New technology is rewriting the entire economic history of the world. The Atlantic monopoly that used to exist when, uh, I guess, the Second World War ended, when all advanced industry was pretty well on one side or the other of the Atlantic, that has been broken. And what you now have is Japan uh, having led the way, but all of Asia following in behind Japan now in such a way that you can honestly say that the center of the world has shifted. Like the cotton merchants of Lancashire, the Americans in our time are seeing their empire slip away to the Japanese, all of which is making life considerably more uncomfortable for us. Now it's our turn to puzzle over the sources of Japan's strength, its ability to rise from disaster generation after generation. One, of course, is an eye for new technology. This time, the technology is the cheap and powerful microchip. And yet the microchip is nothing more or less than a tool. If it hadn't been invented, we would all have survived. What makes a tool crucial in a competitive world is not so much that it exists, but that someone else has it, and you don't. Out of the ashes of World War II, Japan has performed what appears to be an economic miracle. Though it was invented by an American, it was the Japanese who recognized in the microchip the beginning of a revolution. For a nation that was already leaping ahead as the next economic superpower, the new technology was the final push. Today, Japanese goods produced in automated factories by dedicated workers flood the markets of the world and have produced a prosperity they could never have imagined. Japan has become one of the richest nations in the world. A people who could hardly afford rice 40 years ago, today can afford to make all their dreams come true. With a population less than half that of the United States, and a rate of economic growth that is double that of the U.S., the Japanese economy is predicted to pass the Americans and lead the world by the 1990s. And yet, what seems at first an economic miracle is really more of a balancing act. 
Japan's recovery has been achieved not just through new technology and a fierce spirit of competition, but because of something equally important. A heritage of social discipline, self-sacrifice and cooperation that has made Japan what it is today. But the train loads of workers who pour into Tokyo at dawn each morning to do their jobs in the capital are beginning to hear the first echoes of something new and disturbing. Beneath the surface of certainty and confidence is the growing awareness that the latest wave of technology could mean the end of a lot of their jobs. So far, the Japanese economy has grown fast enough to keep pace, and new jobs and new industries have appeared even as the old ones disappeared. But the Japanese are on the cutting edge of automation. And for many workers here, that could turn out to be a dangerous place to be. When there is a machine to do just about anything. Though the rate of unemployment is still less than 3% in Japan, the pace of automation has the unions here worried about what the future might hold. What do you think will happen? Well, I think that it's depend on how the new technology develop in the rate of development and the rate of introduction into the industries. And if that takes that uh, big stride, I think it's quite possible we have the uh, uh, experience of unemployment. There are many uh, people saying that uh, there's a great possibility of such uh, unemployment may come also to the, our industry in the very near future. And that is the reason that from the union point of view at this moment, we are asking the government and management people to have a tripartite committees to study on the possible unemployment problems due to the new technologies. And so far, we are getting the very good response, on, not only from the government, but also from the management associations. There is a tradition within the big Japanese corporations of taking care of their workers, not out of altruism, but because it's good for business. A lesson that corporate executives elsewhere in the world have been slow to learn. There are other clouds on the horizon. A new generation whose heroes do not appear to be the dedicated workers who made Japan the economic giant it has become. On the other hand, it is easy to make too much of this. A little decadence has always been one of the privileges of empire. A more serious problem for this generation is the growing number of women 
emerging from their traditional roles to look for careers of their own at a time when the job prospects are looking bleaker. These next few years are crucial for Japan, but they are still way ahead of countries like Canada that are only now scrambling to jump on the bandwagon of advanced technology. And at the same time, trying to survive the jolts of the transition. For us, time is quickly running out. If Canada doesn't move to new technology smartly, then we basically all have to get together and pray that by some fluke, natural resources will make us as rich in the future as it did in the past. And yet fewer and fewer voices are heard resisting that kind of message. Today, union leaders like Fred Pomeroy, whose members are directly in the line of fire, are the first to believe that the switch to new technology is long overdue. I think that's where uh, the future, the real future lies. The only way we're going to have secure jobs and high standards of living is to be on the leading edge uh, in the use of technology. Now, that doesn't mean that, that everyone in the country is going to be uh, some kind of computer whiz kid out there uh, uh, you know, leading the Star Wars Brigade. But by being on that frontier uh, technologically, it creates all kinds of other jobs at all levels through the economy and, and makes it possible to have uh, many of the social services and so on that, that uh, generate uh, other jobs. Okay, what we have here is a, uh, a geometric model of a... New technology opens the door to new ways of manufacturing. Uh, Computerized systems dryer, like this, this allow a skilled operator to design a product on the screen and then send the design to another machine on the factory floor. We're going to go from this machine to a machine in the machine shop. Exactly. The surface model is coming. While the first wave of technology favored big corporations and rich nations, the new wave gives smaller competitors an edge. And that's good news for Canada. That's what the technology promises. It promises the ability to customize and produce uh, relatively small batches with the kind of economy that was available through mass production 20 or 30 years ago. Traditionally, Canada has had to take the chunk of North American business that deals with a few of this, a few of that, a few of something else. And in my opinion, this is one of the greatest opportunities for really cashing in on flexibility. If you compare this with uh, a plant down in the States which is dedicated to doing thousands of the same thing, they don't have quite so much benefit from this technology as we do in Canada. So on a personal note at least, I'm rather optimistic for Canada's uh, level of sophistication in this sort of technology over the next 20 or 30 years. We should also face up to a few uncomfortable facts. The computers our kids are playing with today are not made here for the most part, nor is most of the key technology, and more of it should be. Our investment in research and development is less than 1%, far lower than all the other developed countries, simply because so many of our companies are foreign-owned, and the research is being done back at the home office. And our educational system has been slow to adapt. And so it is the parents with the time and the education themselves who are doing what they can to make their kids winners. And someone else's kids can be the losers. But is that really the kind of society we want to see Canada become? A nation more and more divided between those few who get ahead and the growing numbers left behind. Even the most optimistic business people don't suggest that we're going to create a lot of jobs. The most optimistic scenarios that I've seen is that we will maybe have uh, as many jobs 10 years from now as we had in 1980. There's another scenario where a limited number of highly skilled jobs will be created and many other uh, low-skilled jobs will be created. 
the ratio I've heard often is 20% highly skilled, 80% uh, low skilled jobs. And that has to create uh, social turmoil. I don't think it has to be that way. Well, the obvious question is, what is the technological change being introduced for? And who is in charge of the priority setting? The impulse to introduce technological change for innovation, to do what you're doing better or to do new things, is a very muted impulse. Certainly muted during the, the, the kind of rather conservative, cautious economic times that we've been experiencing over the last few years, but also tending to be muted because the kind of people making the decisions about implementing technological change are bottom line people who want to make sure that um, the company is doing very well and, and perhaps have a requirement to deliver more profits and therefore they're not going to be saying, hey, let's innovate which is going to mean keeping staff and maybe hiring more staff or sending people off for additional training. No, their thinking is much more on the lines of automate to reduce costs. And so they're going the route of jobless economic growth. We would be reckless indeed to leave the responsibility for social planning in the hands of executives whose job is to produce profits and whose record on the introduction of new technology has been something less than inspiring. Out of what we are today, this country is going to have to fashion a new social contract to replace the old one. And there are a lot of hard questions that remain unanswered. Who will have jobs in the years ahead? Should every job that can be automated be automated? Are the old jobs worth saving? Which ones? How will we decide? The country is used to the idea that unemployment is part of the lot of those who've had no training, no education, grown up in poor circumstances. What we're going to find now as new technology takes over is that many of the unemployed are people who have been trained, who were earning a good wage, uh, who had some education, sometimes considerable amount of education. Uh, their only crime, if you like, will be that they happen to be in the wrong industries. The wrong industry, the wrong town. In fact, the real crime would be that on the day when Aristotle's dream comes true, when the looms of industry weave on their own, we abandon the people whose hands once did the work. The people who live in these houses are the children of the first industrial revolution. Now the question is, what happens to their kids? There's a new revolution taking place, but there's an unfairness about that revolution. That revolution doesn't come to towns like this. It creates whole new areas of power. It creates new areas where people live. And it's easy to say that the new jobs are going to be there for people to take, but it's not necessarily true that it's the people in these kinds of neighborhoods or their kids who are going to get those new kinds of jobs. It's putting the lie to everything we were taught when we went to school. That you work hard, you bust your ass, and you're going to get a good job. Because it doesn't matter what you do, you aren't working, friend. You're out of work, buddy. And this society is still saying you're a lazy bum. 